Dorothea Lange is one of the all-time great documentary photographers. She impacted social change through her photography of the Great Depression and Japanese internment camps. Recently, I visited the Adeldorg Museum in Indianapolis to view a new exhibit of her work entitled Changing Views, the Photography of Dorothea Lange. In this video, we'll hear from curator Dr. Jessica Nelson and photographer Wildstyle Peschel, an Indianapolis-based artist and one of four contemporary photographers featured in the exhibit. Well, the initial um, few photographs that you see in this exhibition come from Dorothea Lange's personal work um, before she really entered into documentary photography. As a young woman, she opened up her own portrait studio. That's what she spent the first decade or so of her career doing. Um, she was, uh, her first marriage was to the painter, Western painter Maynard Dixon. This is a very early example of her photography. One of her first kind of outdoor prints, uh, or uh, outdoor portraits, um, unposed-ish. Different from the like, directive style that you might have in a portrait studio. This image is called White Angel Breadline from San Francisco in 1933. Um, and it, represents kind of a turning point in Dorothea Lange's career. She, you know, the, the Great Depression um, was kind of sweeping across the nation at this point. And uh, as she retells the story, she was actually in her portrait studio, um, looking out the window, seeing these crowds of men gathering. And um, this in particular, these men were, were waiting for a free meal, basically. The white angel refers to um, this generous benefactor in San Francisco who would just serve a free meal once a day. Um, and so she found herself kind of carried out, or she, she felt compelled to kind of go out and document the scene. Um, she took this image, uh, developed it, and then hung it within, in her portrait studio. Um, and folks would kind of come by and ask her like, what are you gonna do with that picture? Why, why is it on your wall? But eventually she sort of gained her reputation um, from that. Um, she met the man who would become her second husband, Paul S. Taylor, was a sociologist um, at Berkeley and he was going out and kind of documenting the plight of unemployed farm workers statistically and with interviews and writing these reports and he saw her pictures and realized the power that they would have. So he actually hired her to accompany him on his research trips. She was listed initially as like a typist and secretary because there was no money for a photographer. Florence Thompson is the woman being photographed. She had an older daughter um, and like pictured here in this image. Lang, I think, was a little bit concerned that there would be confusion over whose children, the younger kids. So she decided to focus in on uh, Florence Thompson. Um, so we know that Lang like directed the children to look away from the camera, to frame Thompson's face. I think there's some of those elements of her work as a portrait photographer kind of come through. I think the, the best way to address it is to quote uh, there by Dorothea Lane, the, the good photograph is not the object. The consequences of the photograph are the object. And with that, uh, you know, when, you, when people are the, you know, the focus of it and it, it is artistic, it's often, you know, what are the consequences? Did, did, did you affect change? Did you help, uh, you know, especially if it's trauma related or, so, you know, something of that nature, did you help prevent this from happening to other people. And, you know, if your goal was to make art, to put in a photography book with no consideration of, of how the pictures are gonna be used, then yeah, I think that's an issue. But, you know, with Dorothea, she had a purpose uh, and they used her work to pass New Deal legislation to help uh, address poverty uh, in the U.S. And so uh, it, it was art after the fact, but it was, you know, her original purpose, was, which she succeeded at, was helping people. Mm -hmm. I think she was more um, progressive than, than, folk, than people realize nowadays, maybe. About a third of the photography that she produced for the FSA um, focused on the experiences of people of color, but none of those were widely circulated. She had, you know, she sent her negatives off to Washington, D.C. They chose which images to use to circulate. Um, and so her sort of approach to racial equality was, was kind of erased um, through that process. And once again, um, and, and a similar story with her, with her images of people of Japanese descent, Japanese Americans. So she uh, was hired by the War Relocation Authority to document the process of um, the implementation of removal orders for um, Japanese people and Japanese American people. And so she uh, 
which was surprising. It doesn't make sense that she was the one hired because uh, people should have known that she was a little bit, uh, that she was opposed to this. She was one of the one of very few, actually, um, white people who was actively speaking against this. Her husband, uh, Paul Taylor, was on a committee at Berkeley opposed to it. Um, but I think they just kind of knew, like, she was a photographer who had worked for the government and made some propaganda for us, and maybe she'll do it again. Um, but what she did differently is she started the story earlier, earlier than they really realized, maybe. Um, she began by photographing um, Japanese and Japanese Americans in, uh, in their neighborhoods, where they were working, where they were living. I love this Pledge of Allegiance image um, of the children in the multiracial public school um, pledging loyalty to the flag of the United States. Um, and then she documented sort of the process of removal um, and had a very um, uh, sympathetic eye to the experience of the people in those um, internment camps and incarceration camps um, with that. And, and, and so, unsurprisingly, the images, the photographs technically weren't censored, but the government just sort of sat on them, um, kept them all in a, in a drawer in the National Archives. There was some circulation of them in like the 1960s and 70s. She literally smuggled some negatives out. She was supposed to turn all of her negatives over to the government, um, to, the, to the officers in charge of the camp. She like got a couple of them out. Um, but there wasn't a whole lot of attention to them until kind of the 1990s, early 2000s. She very much understood the impact of changing economic conditions. Um, her husband was uh, kind of opposed to sort of large-scale agriculture and, and saw the ways in which the mechanization of agriculture was um, putting people out of work. But also she saw about the construction of like a dam um, that was going to provide uh, a water source for farmers, but also actually flood a town <laughs> and like displace everybody. Uh, wow. um, so she, she had a very keen eye for the impact of those kind of technological changes on the landscape and how it made life um, more difficult for, for people trying to earn a living off of the land. Thanks for watching. The exhibit runs through August 6, 2023. Visit the links in the description for more information and to see upcoming events connected to this exhibit.